<laughs> live on custom live streaming service. <laughs> Oops. We're gonna have this problem every week. Yeah. Okay. View I'll... stream on custom live. Yeah, we are live. Hi, everyone. <laughs> are we see? Are we seeing everyone on YouTube and everywhere? I don't see anything on YouTube. Do you have your monitor like up there? Yeah, it's like above my desk. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like I have my laptop down here, and then I have my studio monitor up here. So that's why I'm okay. always looking up. Interesting. Let me check my own YouTube channel. I want to do that now. That's what I'm looking while for. We're, just an hour live. While we might be even live, I'm going to do this anyways now. Videos. Yeah, he said, he said it weren't earlier, but now we are. Oh, well, hello, everybody. <laughs> do, you, do you think we are? I, oh, yeah, we are. I see, my, uh, I see myself on YouTube. Great. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, I just, I couldn't handle a, a trip to the grocery store to pick up beer. So I had what some Japanese plum wine oh, wow. uh, that I picked up in Japan in January that um, is really delicious. But honestly, I, I got I, I to wait with my beer. I need to drink my water first. Kyle, mm. Kyle says he's waiting to be let. Oop. Yeah, I'll, I'll get him on in a second. <laughs> you can spoil it already. Uh, all, right, all right, everyone. Um, Welcome to uh, episode number seven of DJs and Beers. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. I hope you're all healthy and uh, well out there at home. And I believe since we might have some new viewers by now, uh, I thought I'll give you a little uh, bit of context and history of what the show is about and what, we, uh, what we've been doing so far and how it's been e evolving. And we're actually missing one person, which is Mo. And I have to tell you already, he might be coming on a little later. He had a little uh, incident at home, a family emergency. His little son hit his teeth and he had to go to the dentist. So Mo is actually not with us right now. Uh, but we have Mo's guest here, Mo's DJ guest. And um, uh, let me get him on. But uh, I, I would say we have, we, have, we, have, we have him on. I'll admit him here. Hold on. We can bring him in. There he is. Kyle, hi. Hey, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Kyle. His, his audio is connecting, looks like, still. OK, we can't hear you, Kyle, but we're, we're happy to have you here. We'll welcome yeah. you in a little bit. Hold on, because I wanted to just give the people a little rundown of why we're all suddenly like changing things around and, and have you on as a show. So. Um, uh, for those people who, who are tuning in new on, on this show, um, when we started off uh, this show, it was essentially to chat with each other while having a beer and hearing from you in the comments and answering your questions and essentially basically to stay in touch uh, with each other during these times here. And uh, it was actually David who started this in a way as he had a Q&A session with his fans very early on this lockdown on his it was on his on your instagram right on, on facebook on facebook and and i kind of I, I really liked that idea and so i i asked matt mo and ali if they like might be into that idea and and this is how our first djs and beers episode already six weeks ago came into in, in into the making um, it's crazy. We're already like in seventh episode, and after the first episode, we didn't even know if we want to do a second episode. So, um, but I, I want to just make some things clear. Like we're a democratic group of people here, and uh, there's not really a, such a thing as a leader of us here. Uh, even though I'm talking now, and I usually start the show, and sometimes I'm kind of moderating it, we're all weighing in here uh, equally. And uh, anyone can basically take over and take the lead at any time. Um, so just being, being saying that uh, after a show or two, we decided to spice things here up a little bit uh, and invite a secret DJ guest that uh, each one of us would be choosing and not even telling the others. So it would be kind of the fun thing that we would not even know ourselves who the D uh, secret DJ guest is. Um, but since last week, I guess, yeah, last week, we decided against it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. A, we're really, really bad in keeping secrets. 
uh, towards <laughs> each other. A WhatsApp group was sometimes so flaky that somebody wrote in, oh yeah, we can talk to Alan about this. Oh no, that was our secret guest from last week. And uh, B, we found out that um, we, we uh, probably can prepare a little better for this guest and our show would be a bit more uh, interesting for you guys out there. And we would maybe have less moments of quite awkward silence <laughs> where we don't know what to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, additionally to that, so this, so this time we, we actually decided against to keep the, 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 the guest secret towards you guys um, because it makes more sense. And uh, as I just explained to you, Mo has chosen Kyle to be on our show, which I'm getting to a little later. Um, as additionally, what uh, the changes were, we tried to structure the show a little better. Um, since we want to answer your questions that you can leave in any comments of all our social medias here, we have Andy monitoring us in the background. Um, and he kind of like monitors the social and picks out the most asked and the most interesting questions. Uh, he collects them and then in about the last half an hour of the show, uh, the last hour, what? Half hour. Uh, yeah, the last hour, half hour of the show, I'm not sure, we're always really bad with our timing. He's basically coming in and uh, giving us the questions and we can answer them to you. So, um, bef so while you have questions now, just t t type it in in the comment sections, no matter where you're watching this, on the Facebook channels, on the YouTube channels, Andy is like the uh, person with the eight hands and 20 monitors, and he's just kind of looking at all of them. Uh, so we can answer your questions. And the, the first hour is usually dedicated um, to A, our, our guests that we have on the show. Um, and uh, usually we start up the show of what was happening during the week. <laughs> Not much, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, what's happening much. during the week? And, and usually it's kind of like, uh, yeah, what's happening during the week? Uh, yeah, I did this and I produced that and, and I went out with my dog or something like this. Um, but uh, yeah, you guys can see that there's an elephant behind me. Oh, is that an elephant behind you? Um, you, guys, well, you, guys, you guys see the elephant? It's just hanging back there, like, waiting to be introduced. Right. <laughs> He's mm. the other guest. I'm still drinking water. So maybe since I'm still talking, maybe I can start to tell the people how my, my, my week went. Um, it was kind of a, a quiet week uh, until I woke up on, I think it was Monday morning, uh, to a video by an English DJ that kind of went viral. And this DJ, he was criticizing some famous colleagues, uh, some famous DJ colleagues for asking the public to donate money for their tour managers, um, whom you might could think are also out of work right now, as, as we all are. Uh, and a lot of people jumped on that. Um, but I think m m some of you might have missed what was going on. So let me give you just a little teeny tiny rundown of what was actually going on. And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm trying to get this uh, properly together uh, that so a bunch of tour managers um, from some of us uh, that are not touring had the glorious idea uh, to set up a page, <laughs> yeah, selling DJ mixes to make some money. And they asked their famous DJ friends to contrib contribute um, exclusive mixes. And not only that, also a video shout out to promote that campaign or cause or whatever you want to call it. Um, they, they basically ask their bosses. Their, their, they ask their employers. They ask their employers. Maybe they're friends. Yeah, we are friends. Or their former employers, maybe, because we're all out of a job. Or in my case, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean I'll give you my best. It depends on in what working relationship uh, that is. And to me, like, this is now my opinion, and you're all very welcome now later to share the opinion. Uh, um, to me, there's various red flags that everyone involved in this should have really, really seen. So on the one hand, DJ mixes are not only illegal to uh, offer as a free download, uh, it's even worse to ask money for them, especially, and not only especially, I mean, uh, uh, because you haven't cleared the rights of each individual tracks and 
actually pay the producers for the work because that's usually how it works. You, you want to sell a mixed CD that was in the early days, CDs guys, the little silver things. You, you, you mix that together, you go to all the labels, you request the rights for it, you make a deal with them, how much they're getting and so on. So it's really illegal to basically sell um, DJ mixes, red flag number one. I would say red flag number two is, and that goes especially goes out to the DJs I find that are involved. And that's my question, like, didn't it cross your mind when you, famous DJs, actually more famous than your tour managers, are asked by your tour managers to do a video shout out to promote a campaign that sells DJ mixes, illegal ones, um, for their own benefit that goes into their pocket. I mean, didn't it cross your mind that this might not even like come across a little bit bad and maybe backfire, especially in times where so many people are hurting and suffering out there? And you are asking actually those people out there to fund your tour managers because this is how it comes across. And I know most people involved in this controversy. I, I, I do. And I, and, and this is, I, want to, I want to get this out of the way. I can tell you this. As far as I know all of them, and I know some of them for many, many years, they don't have a bad bone in the body. And actually, we have one of them on our show right here. Interesting enough. Like for me, it's up there. Um, and... It, I have to say everyone involved of these DJs acted extremely stupid. And, and there's no other way for me to explain this. And first to the tour manager set this whole thing up. What a lazy ass idea is that actually? You're, you're all so much more creative, I think, and come up with better ideas than to just to sell basically pre-recorded mixes on a Bandcamp site. Um, which essentially, as I have to say it again, is, is illegal. Um, to the DJs involved that I want to address too, I, I really wonder what you were thinking. You, you all run labels, and I just, as I just mentioned, you run labels since a long time. You're in th this business for a long time. You, you should know about the legal requirements uh, and, uh, of, of the whole thing, like this, that this is not really like kosher what you're doing. And at the same time, I would wonder, like, where were your managers? Like, did you even speak to them before? They could have seen those red flags, maybe. Um, so don't, don't you think that, that behavior was a little wrong in, in that way? And, and then, I mean, after looking at that video and, and seeing all this coming down, uh, I, I saw the reaction of most of you DJs that were involved in, in, in this whole thing. And there were apologies in there where I was just like thinking to myself, what? Like, please spare us with this, you know? Um, just by, by, by apologizing that you didn't know enough about what's going on and you just trusted your tour managers that they were doing something good and you just want to help. Uh, or on the other hand, my tour manager wasn't involved or I didn't even deliver a mix. I just delivered a video and I wanted to help these guys. Again, you were basically doing a video where you're saying support my tour manager because he's out of a job. Like in that moment where you say that, I mean, it's all easy to say in hindsight for me. But in the moment where you say something like that and, and, and you're kind of like thinking like, what are they actually selling and where and why am I saying this? Any, anyways, it's, it's just, it comes out to you and it's kind of like people, you're famous, you have responsibility and, and people are listening to you. This is kind of my, my, my point of it. And I, I do assume you were just, uh, you just wanted to help and, and I guess you maybe even got duped by your tour managers in a way who, who, who again, I don't think they have a bad bone in their body where they just had a really bad idea. Um, but, uh, it's, 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 it is your responsibility to thoroughly check um, what, are your, what, what are you helping. If you, if, if you want to help a, a charity, you usually go and check what, who's doing the charity, um, what's behind it, what are they doing with my product. Uh, and I, I think making excuses now is kind of lame. And, uh, like saying like, oh, I didn't know, I had no idea. I mean, even saying like, I don't know, even know up till today what Bandcamp was. Well, then fucking find out what it is. 
Like, like, even if it's your tour manager asking you for a favor, you should, you should, you have a responsibility. You should really find out what this is about and where it goes to. And it's not an excuse to say, I didn't know enough about it. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't, I don't have anything to do with it. This is kind of like my idea about it. Um, and it's kind of an easy way out for you. But, but that's, not, that's not even all that I think that, you, you, that those who were involved acted pretty stupid. Um, I want to lastly uh, address this to the trolls out there who kind of had a field day with this controversy. And it was really easy to jump on from the safety of your own little couch at home. <laughs> Uh, and not even knowing all the details, and that, that's another thing, you don't even have all that information. Um, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm sure it was fun to do this all, but uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it, I can't even get all this together. It's, it's like, of course, the trolls having fun and they jump on it and, and famous DJs are involved. But there's also some trolls who are not that random sittingly on their small little couches, there's some trolls who actually have the phone numbers and are friends with those DJs involved. And they even jumped on this thing and, and started to spread all the, I would almost say misinformation. Why didn't you take, pick up the phone and call your colleagues before you went public with this? A, to maybe tell them, dude, there's something online which might come across a little weird, did you think this through? Um, was this um, um, meant to be this way? Or didn't you just like fail to see the whole picture of it? Then maybe take it down. And if you stand to it, because then I'm going to do a big post about it and take you down. Like, wouldn't that be a little bit the thing, how, how to do it? Especially not like taking it even a step further and, and then saying like, uh, and, and spinning it into, this is a big sign of how fucked up our scene is and how bad it is and and again i have to say none of them probably meant this in a bad way and uh being bad is not the same thing as being being evil or being dumb let's say that is the way being dumb is not the, the same thing as being evil i actually funnily heard this saying last last night so um uh i i think i, I don't know what you got out of this when it comes to the trolls i think everyone involved was pretty stupid and I, I, I just want to end this by saying, like, there's so much trolling going on out there and so much negativity going on out there. And especially in times like these, shouldn't we all be a little bit more helping out each other and being there for each other um, instead of, like, fanning the flames um, uh, in a controversy like this where obviously people made mistakes, but they didn't make them out of, out of evil... Uh, uh, thinking and and putting up evil schemes to to have people make make uh, some people make money out of the back from people who are hurting out there um so maybe we should all do some soul searching here and and tame things a little down but especially to everyone who's like wanting to help a charity i think one of the things is it's about accountability and responsibility check what this is for learn out of this and don't Try and get the easy way out. This is my thinking. I've made mistakes myself online and, and, and got into hot water and everything. Just own up to it. Um, say sorry and move on. That's, yeah. that's what I think. So this is how my week went. Um, Ali, how was your week? <laughs> it pretty much, pretty much went like that. You explained it well. I mean... You are absolutely correct. And we had a couple conversations about it over the last few days because I really value your perspective on a lot of things. And I have since, especially, I mean, we've been friends a long time, but um, especially more so like when I first went solo and I mean, it's, it's all documented in interviews that I've given or whatever, uh, how much you kind of were there to give me a bit of guidance when I felt lost. So, you know, sometimes when I feel lost, I look to you me? <laughs> to kind of give me, yeah, believe it or not, you, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. Um, this was, I agree with you 100%. This was the dumbest idea, right? And we should know better, right? Because 
on a daily basis, someone comes to us and wants to borrow our name or our DJ mix or a quote or something, some sort of a brand asset that we own. We, we own and control our own brand. They want to exploit it somehow. Sometimes it's for their own benefit. Sometimes it's for charity. Sometimes it's for product, you know, whether it's remix, production, um, you know, you're, you're doing something for, for a label, mix CDs like we used to do back in the day. Um, and so we're constantly um, vetting that process, constantly. For some reason, and I can only speak on my behalf, I can't speak for any of the other DJs. I can't speak for uh, the dynamic that any of them have with their tour managers. I can only speak about mine. Um, be, maybe because it was my tour manager and maybe, I mean, a, to, to give you a bit of backstory, Tim and I have been together for more than 15 years. That's a really long time um, to be with somebody. And there's a reason why uh, we've been together that long. A, um, we get on on a personal level. B, He's obviously able to perform the job that, that I need him to. Um, and C, he's being looked after well. He's being taken care of. So for anybody that's questioning whether I've uh, not taken care of my tour manager, that's utter bullshit. Um, now, having said that, Tim and I, after 15 years together, as with um, you know, many business or creative partnerships, there's a beginning, middle, and end. And we were we felt, felt both together that we had started in one place, the industry had evolved and, and changed, we evolved as people, um, and our needs ha had evolved. And so we were, you know, kind of growing apart and not really getting along. And, you know, there's a, there's a number of different things that I could talk about as far as the uh, artist tour manager dynamic, which I'm sure we're gonna cover in a future show when we actually have tour managers as, as guests on the show. Yeah, we should. Um, so I'm not going to delve into that, but basically we grew apart, uh, decided that, you know, I would, you know, have him finish up through the beginning of, well, the end of May. And I had another guy on standby ready to start the beginning of June. And this was all pre COVID. And then like the whole COVID thing happened, caught everyone by surprise. I'm, I, you know, I, I was in LA recording every day, going to the studio. I'm like in a daze. I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to like minimize the damage. Uh, there's a lot of people, as you know, um, you guys know, and, but but may, maybe the, the the public doesn't know. There's, you know, to make the machine run, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that that are employed by us, that rely on us, um, that you know we're supporting. So I'm dealing with that fall. Um, and, uh, and then I get a, a message from, from my tour manager saying that he's got this idea and he needs my support and, and without even thinking and questioning it and asking anything about what it is, uh, I said, sure, man, whatever you need, because I felt like, I mean, maybe not then later when, um, you know, we got on a, con a phone call, a very quick phone call where he kind of explained it, but I was obviously not paying attention to what he was saying. And that's when I should have probably been paying attention and I should have asked more questions, but maybe I didn't because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want him to feel like I'm not being supportive of this project because he sounded so happy and excited. Not only that, I think had he been doing it all by himself, I probably would have asked more questions. But the fact that there were all these other guys involved who uh, were working for, you know, friends of uh, mine in the industry, very, very powerful friends of mine in the, in, the, in the industry who I assumed collectively would have vetted this thing out a bit. So I was too trusting. I didn't ask enough questions. And, um, and you know, there was even a press release, I remember. I just found it the other day in my inbox. There was a press release for this. So from the top down, um, nobody caught wind that this was a bad idea and like you say, illegal to do on Bandcamp, um, including me. 
and um, you know, I can I can just for all the people that were hurt by this, I can apologize. The best I can do, I think, is offer my apology. Um, since then, and I'm trying to wind this down very quickly. Since then, they've obviously issued a statement. They've taken down the Bandcamp site. They've refunded um, the money that was collected, and um, you know, here we are. And um, I mean, it, it was a dumb fucking <laughs> thing to do, right? And I feel like a complete, I don't need the trolls to tell me what a dumb thing that was. You know, and I don't need the trolls to tell me to pay my tour manager because it's, first of all, none of their business, uh, what our dynamic is. Second of all, uh, and the thing that really gets on my nerves, and I'm trying not to get angry here, is um, the fact that, like, without having all the information, um, the rush to jump to conclusions and judgment about other people, and not just, I can understand, you know, the troll mob mentality that exists out there, because it, it's existed ever since, you know, social media became this thing. Um, what I, what really, really cut deep for me was uh, the fact that colleagues, friends were rushing to judgment and making their uh, opinions public um, as if this is some gladiator show. Um, you know, grab the popcorn. Let's, let me throw uh, my good friend here under the bus even more. Let me fan the flames even more. And uh, let's watch and see what happens. It's that fucking mentality that really pisses me off. And I can't say any more about that because I'll get really angry and say something. Okay, so maybe, maybe Matt and, and David, maybe before you go on, I want to like, we, we needed to get this a little bit out of the way in, in, in the beginning and we would definitely talk about this yeah. more, but, but now let me really, 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 really and happily. Also, and also I wanted to say like, I wanted to say like, we do these chats um, as, as obviously, you know, because we enjoy each other's company and we're, you know, and we're talking about music and all this other, other stuff, but we're also not shying away from controversy. No, you know? no, and we're I not. didn't say anything. I didn't say anything because I know um, in the heat of the moment, no matter what you say, you're being judged unfairly. Um, mm -hmm. No one wants to hear what you say. And I watched it happen not only to me in the past, but uh, other you know, friends of mine. Um, it's red meat, no matter what you say. They don't care. So the best thing to do is just wait, because I knew that you would give me an ass reaming about it, uh, and I would come on the show and I would answer to it as well. So that's another reason why, if anyone's wondering why I haven't said anything up till now, no, no. Well, it's because, you know. And 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 I do believe public, you. You were the one of the few, like, you the only DJ involved who actually reacted in, in, in the best possible way. Just let it sink in, just think well, about it, I and, knew, and, and now coming on talking about it. Great. Yeah, I, I can't speak for them, but did yeah. I fuck up? Of course. <laughs> but with this out of the way, with this out of the way, please let me welcome Carl Geiger on the show. Um, Hi, Kyle. What a time to be alive. <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for coming on the show. and. And and I love the fact how you how you uh, wanted me to to um, to put your number in my phone. Best DJ over six feet tall from Southern Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I mean there might be a few that could could compete with that, but I think that that's a very that's the highest accolade I've received so far. So. I, I, I would I would say you are. Let me let me just say thanks for being on the show. I'm sorry that your actual uh, host Mo can't be with us right now, but maybe he's with his son, so that's more important. Um, uh, let me start off by saying really really happy you're here. And uh, I don't happy know if you rem do, do you remember the time we've met for the first time? Do you actually know? Would remember that? Because I, I do. I totally do, um, and I'm I'm curious if you're thinking of the same time. Let's let's see. I do believe it was on the dance floor of um, the main floor of the Movement Detroit Festival, while it was even a little bit raining, 
and you were hanging out with Dustin Sahn there. And I, I, I came and, and joined your group and we all got to know each other. Maybe there has been an incident before this, which I don't remember, but- That was I the first that, time we really, we I think that was the first time we met where you might've known who I was. How many um, years ago has this been? That was, that would have been, I think, 2009. Oh. Maybe 2010. Right. I'm not sure. Then it's almost the 11 time, year anniversary. <laughs> the first time, the first time I actually met you, and one of the re you know after um, the uh, the big news broke this week, um, it was the question came up. Don't know why. Do you still want to be on the show? And I said, mm -hmm. well. Um, I've, first off, I'll say this. Um, I am really against the mentality that you can only sit down at a table with people that you perfectly agree with 100% of the time. So that alone is uh, enough reason to be on the show. And um, I've had, uh, but the thing for you, Chris, is the first time I met you, you could have really bailed on a situation because I met you as a raver when it, I drove to Chicago from my university. It was like a two and a half hour car ride. And I drove to see you play in Chicago on Thursday night. It was like, I think two, a week or two after you had just played I Love Techno sold out 35,000 people in 5,000 each room or whatever. And there were 15 people at this show in Chicago. And, and you played still with this same shit eating grin that you have, uh, that I'm sure you had at I Love Techno. And it was, it was just one of the most inspiring things to see such a big DJ, like not blow off people that don't have like, that aren't the big party, that aren't like, you know, and, and we've all had the gig after Bergheim, you know, <laughs> and that could have very likely been your situation where uh, you could have said, I'm too good for this, you know, I don't deserve this or whatever. And you just kept, it was in the final scratch days, played on three turntables and uh, destroyed all 15 of us. Yeah. Well, thank <laughs> so, you. <laughs> that was the first time I actually met you. Thank you so that much. That was a long story. Wow, and here you guys are. <laughs> here, here, here we are. But we also yeah. we also want to uh, we also don't want to forget to know how the week was so far for David and Matt. <laughs> Does it matter anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe you have something to say to the whole David, controversy David too. It wasn't exciting. I mean, it wasn't as exciting. here we go. We're on the show. Go for it. Um, Popcorn. Uh, personally, for me, <laughs> I mean, personally for me, my week has been with the label stuff and all that. Blah blah blah. But like, I'm not, I mean, in all these situation, I'm not one to publicly like scorn someone. And like, I think a lot of people are expecting me to like attack him for what he's done. And he obviously know he fucked up really bad and it was really dumb. And we spoke about this yesterday too. So like, it was a fuck up, people fuck up. And it happens all the time, but people want to, uh, they want to jump down people's throats and be like, yeah, you know, you fucked up and he knows he did. So I don't, there's not much else I can say. I mean, I've never had a tour manager. I'm not rich. Um, I, I don't know the whole situation behind the scenes. He explained it. And it seems like it was just a really poorly managed uh, campaign. And I think, uh, yeah, it was just a big fuck up. I don't know what else there is to say about it, to be honest. That's it. <laughs> um. I've been actually, I, I was remixing you, Chris. I did a remix for you. Um, and what a remix this is. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's I mean, I, I, actually, yeah, I, 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 was this Tuesday night that I sent it when you had a fever? Was it Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've been doing that. And also we've been planning 
uh, there's some new served tracks, some songs, and we're actually going to another studio tomorrow to record some vocals. So yeah, just juggling that and the label, planning stuff, kind of we're pretty much done now for the year with all of the releases. So yeah, that's it. Sweet, but but I, I don't I don't want to uh, uh, I, I just want to have your two cents on the whole situation too, and then we can leave this behind because I think one major thing that that also contributed to the whole controversy is that most people had the perception that actually the DJs did set up this whole thing. You know, no, this, this, this was like perpetrated. I think. I mean, obviously, um, once it's out there, uh, people are reinterpreting it. And yeah. they're giving their own spin on it. Um, I, think I don't think most people realize that this guy, John Askew, has a history with Carl Cox. Like, yeah. they worked together in the past. And for anybody uh, that saw the video that he posted, clearly the guy spent a great deal of time shooting it and editing it together to um, ultimately create a, a false kind of narrative, right? And what, it, what you know, you have to question the motives. I don't know. More likes, more followers, maybe his career could use a boost and this was a way to do it. Uh, I don't know, these are unanswered questions, but it makes you wonder. I have to say uh, just with that, that was one thing that I did notice is that, and. I mean, we're in an era of where misinformation is just kind of the norm. And yeah. I think that this can be, it's really easy when, some, like, the first time I saw this video, it was attached, it was coupled together already with commentary. Yeah. So it's not like I saw that video by itself and then could make a decision. I had the video pause, here's what this means, pause, here's what this means, pause. And, and I think people need to be really careful no matter, no matter what the situation is. I mean, this is really what Fox News does. You know, they, they put, take a sound bite and then they say, how can Barack Obama be okay with doing yeah. this? And you're like, that's not what he said. And you yeah. know this. And I think that if you take the assumption of bad faith with anybody's motives, it, then the sky's kind of the limits with, with how, how far down you can take someone and feel kind of justified yeah. with it. And so, I mean, I, I, it's no secret that I thought that even probably if I saw the video on its own, I would have thought it was tone deaf. Yeah. But I think it's it has to be met with a little bit of scrutiny when it's already attached to commentary and then yeah. people start sharing the video with their commentary on top of the commentary and it just builds this kind of... Yeah, and I, I, I didn't even ask to see the video before, uh, you know, my team posted it. Not only that, but like I said... Well, wait a minute, what video are you talking about? I'm talking about the one that from John the person that was, it was the video of the guy watching the video. Yeah, he's, you know, he's talking about John Askew's video. I'm talking yeah, about- Yeah, you're talking about the, the video, video that John, he was watching. The video John Askew was dissecting, uh, yeah. I didn't even see before. before but that, that's, my, that's another question that comes in. It's like, we're not new to this business. We're all in this no, business. No. And this is what mind like, bothers me. You, you usually get these things approved before they go online. You right. let every interview approve. You let we, every video approve. And you just let you guys think, do whatever you want? I mean, I honestly think, what? had it been anyone else but a tour, our tour manager, it would have been fully vetted. But for whatever reason, you know, maybe we just, you know, this thought that they would do the right thing, you know, and it backfired. And not only that, but there was an actual press release with a quote uh, that was disseminated to, I'm sure, RA and literally every other uh, media outlet. Nobody 
mentioned it. Nobody said anything about it until uh, this John Askew character decided to create this elaborate video um, and twist things around the way people are these days with conspiracy theories. There's, it's no different than everyone believing uh, from something they've seen that 5G is bad for you or, or uh, you know, uh, the, pa the COVID thing is like a big hoax and, and government like, you know, um, conspiracy. It, it's, it's ridiculous. They're taking little truths and then mm -hmm. they're spinning it around, weaving their own narrative based on whatever agenda um, but do you, no. Ali, do you not think that, I mean, the pro one of the problems here is obviously one of the, is the misinformation of what an actual tour manager is. And of course, you were just discussing about bringing someone on because I think with the, the glamorization of DJ culture with, with, you know, ladies like Paris Hilton DJing or what, you know, celebrities DJing, I think people, you're are, absolutely correct. Yeah. it's completely, I think the, the concept of what a DJ does, I know, you know, with Chris, it's the same as like when we were doing the serve shows. There's no way that I could set it up all by myself. So we had to have someone to help us. And I've seen Chris's setup. It's immense. You know, and if you're if you're arriving at a festival, you need someone there. You know, you need a backup. But there's, a, I guess, a, it's become a little bit like a few years ago, having a manager. Everyone needs a tour guy. You know, it became a little bit of a, a joke. You know, I think for a lot of people, you know, especially when people. A lot of DJs are just putting in USB sticks. Yeah. Chris and I haven't had tour managers our entire career. You get to a point, and believe me, I don't really want, you know, the, the extra expenses. Yeah. But you get to a point where, because we're, we're embracing new technology, and, and that involves um, having somebody. And also, you're spending more and more time on the road, especially if you're single. You're saying yes to, like, every gig, you know, 100, 130, 140 shows, plus travel on the road and sometimes you need company. Sometimes you need like to have a buffer between you and, um, and, sure. and promoter and, 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 and just the outside world so that you can kind of zero in on, on, on being creative. Yeah. There's a lot of prep involved. Um, I'm not one of those DJs that turns up and plugs a USB stick in and, and here we hey go, now. you know? <laughs> uh, I, I do a lot of prep, you know? Uh, sometimes 10, 12 hours prep, depending on the gig. And uh, you, you're focused on that. You don't want to be like trying to figure out, you know, what time your, your, your ride to the venue is or whether the cash has been collected or all these other things that go into it. I mean, we're going to cover all this. Yeah, we should. In the future show because I think most people, unless they're really good friends with a DJ or really good friends with a tour manager, uh, they don't have a clue what the dynamic is. Yeah. And, um, and how they're compensated, what exactly their job function functions are, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's why it's so easy for, for people to belittle that, you know, or, or make fun or even, you know, troll this whole thing yeah. because they don't, they just don't, they don't understand, you know, that's, uh, yeah. that's it. That was I mean, kind of thing is clear, people, the, the trolls aren't going anywhere. They're just kind of <laughs> multiplying. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna go get a refill while. <laughs> I already almost spilled my first beer. Nice. Oh, another pale ale! Oh, Wonderful. Yeah. Love the hiding. Maybe we should call it DJ some pale ale. Really good. That's a good. Uh, that's a good beer. A uh, brewery. Yeah. Um. I one thing that I hope that doesn't come from this whole shit storm is. I I don't know. I don't think I know many tour managers, but I know quite a few ex tour managers. So <laughs> my my. Senses indicate that it's, it's not a real easy job. It's probably not, and I, you have to, sometimes the comments on this situation started to kind of demean like the whole concept of a tour manager in general. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like the whole reason that this shit storm started is a lot of people are out of work and a lot of people don't know where their next paycheck's gonna come from. Well, and, including us. <laughs> and I, yeah, I mean, I think you might have a little bit of cushion, but uh, <laughs> like for a tour manager, there's really like, 
I have a friend who's a roadie and he was on the road with Metallica and with Muse and he was going out on a regular basis and now nothing, you know? And, and like whether we can talk if a tour manager, the necessity of a tour manager, we can talk about the necessity of a Remova suitcase. We can talk about the necessity of this hoodie. But at the end of the day, like a tour manager is a job that a lot of people don't have right now. And there's, and I, I think the tricky thing with this whole pandemic is there's some people who are really suffering because they don't have work there's some people that are really suffering because they can't not go to work. You know, there's cashiers at grocery stores and people that are working in hospitals and they don't have a, they don't, they can't take time off. They can't say, well, it's not safe to be out there. So like, let's go. So everybody's got pain and struggles coming from different directions. And then it intersects, on this lovely thing called the internet. And I think we just have to give a little bit of grace to the fact that we're, we're gonna say the wrong shit sometimes and we're gonna have good intentions and it's not gonna come out right. And I think the most important thing to remember is that if you are a tour manager, like I've never had a tour manager, so I don't know. I don't even have a booking agent. So the so I'm I'm this bottom tier, but the people are out of work. And I think that that's the most important thing to remember with this whole thing is like before people start di disparaging like the glitz and glam of being a tour manager, don't forget that they don't have work right now. Kind of um, uh, pivot back to your story about having met Chris. Uh, for you, what, like, what was that, that spark, that initial spark? And I was kind of thinking about this uh, yesterday uh, with Florian Schneider's passing from Kraftwerk. Like, for a lot of us, that spark was Kraftwerk. Um, that you know, when when we heard Kraftwerk for the first time, it was like a whole new world that opened up. And, and then we went down that rabbit hole of discovering, you know, as the years went on, you know, groups like Depeche Mode and Yaz, Eurasia, you know, all the new beat stuff that came uh, after that, electronic body music, all that stuff. Just electronic music, it, there was such an exciting buzz around electronic music at the time. Like what was the spark for you? Um, and how long ago was this? Was, was it, a, was it a, a, a club experience? Was it a DJ? Was it uh, craft work? Uh, and, and, and Kyle, well, be, before you answer, we should yes. all do a big cheers and toast to Florian Schneider. Oh, yeah, rest rest in, in peace and rest thank you for the music. Huge experience. Cheers. Uh, huge cheers, experience. everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm actually empty. <laughs> <laughs> we grab another beer. Um, what was the spark? I mean, you know how interviews go. You kind of you kind of focus on the the less embarrassing parts of what yeah. were the sparks. So I'll, I'll like, you know, we'll we'll pass. I don't want you the, to feel like this is an interview. I want you to like tell us maybe something you wouldn't tell someone who's interviewing you, who may have asked the same question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, I grew up in southern Indiana, and city called Evansville and the closest, I mean, records were really something that my parents owned. That it was like John Denver, the Beatles, that wasn't what kids were buying, you know? And you really had to, to the only way to discover music was buying CDs. Like there weren't big record stores where I come from. And, um, but I would go late at night with friends, um, to go to, there's back when, Ali, you'll know this, David, you'll know this, but Blockbuster Music back when, back in those days. And Blockbuster Music was the first thing or the first store that would actually open up the CD out of the packaging, put it in the player, and you could listen to the whole thing at this listening station. They never kicked you out. So this was really like, it was 
paradise for me. And I was listening to a lot of rap because I had a big car stereo that I had built in my car. And um, then I started going into, I, I wanted to get into the mobile DJ world, like just to make cash, like play weddings and do this stuff. And I had bought an issue of DJ Times at uh, um, what I forget what the bookstores were back then, but yeah. I bought an issue of DJ Times just to get the catalog num the 800 numbers for the catalog out of the back so I could order the free catalogs. And on the cover of that um, DJ, Ma DJ Times magazine was Frankie Bones. And it was this dude that was sitting on top of stacks and stacks of records. Uh, and I just kind of looked at it in passing. And then I read about his storm raves in Brooklyn. And um, at Blockbuster Music, they had an electronic music section. And I saw like Frankie Bones and I saw like, I, I went for like the shiniest object in the room. I think it was a DJ IC CD. And uh, <laughs> yeah, like the Florida breaks. And I played it at the listening station and the guy said, what did you think of that? I said, oh, it's all right. And he said, well, if you like that, you should listen to this guy named Bad Boy Bill. <laughs> and I said, I mean, if, if, he, if he has a name like that and he can get a record deal still, then, <laughs> then let's, let's check it out. And so I ever. listened to it in the car <laughs> and I said, or I listened to it on the headphones and I said, man, I've got to hear this in my car. Cause like it sounded better and like harder hitting because it was like that Chicago hard house stuff. And I had bang in the box volume three. And that was, it was like this Chicago hard house, like the UC music type stuff. But then I remember it was track 12 and I was in my car and track 12 came and it was plastic man spastic. Whoa. And like my vision was blurring from the subwoofers because that was like the first time I'd heard like a unfettered 808 in, um, in dance music. So, wow. and so I just went through, I mean, and this is why people are like, people that get annoyed about asking for track IDs. I was literally writing down every track on the back of that CD and then like going to try to find out because I didn't even know where this was but on those old CDs they had a enhanced they were enhanced CDs so they had a music video on them oh, wow. and Bad Boy Bill was shopping in a record store and I said what the fuck is this I said I, <laughs> where is this and it was gramophone records on the re in this little music video from Bang in the Box volume three and then I found out that it was in Chicago and started going to record stores, started tracking down other DJs, and it was like a giant scavenger hunt. But I, I definitely say Bad Boy Bill was the, the thing that started it all for me. It's, it's funny you say Bad Boy Bill because like, I remember in high school, like my freshman year in high school was like when Bang in the Box Volume 1 came out. And that was like in every, everybody's car, everybody that, that's, I can, I can probably, remember every part of that mix listening to it every little cut and everything that he does like just remember it all because i remember hearing it so much and that it's so funny that you say bad boy bill because like yeah he was he was uh in the u.s especially he was really really massive all around the u.s even yeah. in l.a you know but i was like yeah. i never saw him i actually never seen him play live no i seen him play live one time actually he's I'm so live. good He's such a he's Dude, so, such, such a, a technical DJ. DJ. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. And yeah. I and when I started DJing, I had no idea that you could make CDs in like Sonic Foundry or like Pro Tools <laughs> and all this stuff, these professional CDs. So I was like, holy shit, this guy mixes records every 30 seconds. <laughs> and so I, I just thought you had to mix that fast. If you if I ever wanted to be as good as Bad Boy Bill, I had to learn how to mix every 30 seconds, not knowing that these were being dumped into Pro Tools and chopped up professionally. Yeah, exactly. All, this <laughs> all these like, you're like, how the hell is he doing that? <laughs> He's like four- when, when you hear him live? No, I know he could do it. Close. He's got the skills yeah. for sure, yeah. It's crazy.
That's and funny. so like with all those different styles that were around at the time, what was it about techno that spoke to you specifically? I, I discovered techno because I heard techno music going to wait for while I had to wait to hear the next house DJ, you mm. know? And uh, it was actually, I was at a party in Indianapolis and hard floor was there. And everybody's like, oh, hard floor, hard floor. And I was like, yeah, hard floor. And I had no idea who they were. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't want to be the odd man out. So I heard a hard floor play. They did a live set. And then there was another act. And then Mistress Barbara was playing that night. And I had never seen somebody play on three turntables or anything like this. And it was just like, that was really where I had first heard like a full set of techno music was, I mean, the hard floor did a live act on, at that party. And then Mistress Barbara played and I said, that's, that's what I wanna do, you know? So I was playing house music before, before that. Are there any mixes you can share? <laughs> any house mixes? <laughs> Old ones. You know, you got some burnt CDs or tapes somewhere. I do. And they have a pager number on them <laughs> wow. for booking requests. Did you, draw, did you draw your own covers on the CDs? No, man. I, I, I was super pro. I printed out labels. <laughs> <laughs> what was that program called where you can, where you can print the labels from? There was, a, there was a specific one. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Cause I used to do the same. I used to make, I used to make like promo mixes and like print out a just really cheesy label with my email address on it. <laughs> I used to even, we would like set up our voicemails uh, to be like, Hey, this is, this is Kyle. Uh, if you've reached me about a booking request, please leave a, and I was never getting booking requests. <laughs> yeah. then, you know, I was just like, it was just like you had to look like you were doing something, which I all guess my bookings, was... all my bookings were through homies. <laughs> like no, no one ever called me. It was like, hey, we want to book you. It was always like, hey, man, you want to play my party? All right, sure. <laughs> yeah, I was playing like house parties, like I played a party. frat party because they would let me play on play at. <laughs> what about you? What about time. you all? What was Ali? What was the? When did Deep Dish start? How old were you when Deep Dish started? Hold on one, one second, Ali, before you answer, maybe I can jump in for all those people who are still watching out there. You can still leave comments and maybe tell us about your stories, how you discovered your music, because Andy is monitoring it. And you can still ask some questions because we're going to get him in in about like 10 minutes or so in 15 minutes. And then we're going to answer some of your questions. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to get this off my chest. Uh, I mean, I, I was... A, a local DJ, I was heavily into, uh, and I, I, a lot of people realize that now with the weekly reggae and dub streams, and the fact that my name is Dubfire, it's named after a, a, a Lee Scratch Perry song. Um, I was heavily into reggae, uh, hip hop, all the early dance stuff. I was like, at one point, I had a mohawk, I was very much into like the local punk scene. Um, in a nutshell, I was always attracted to the more alternative styles of music. And I was playing, you know, solo around DC and I had a mutual friend with Sharam. Sharam was doing his thing, um, playing a lot of like international parties. Um, some of the music he was playing was, was questionable, but at the time it was still cool. And I think when we met the dynamic, um, it, it created an interesting dynamic because he started to come more towards me and I started to go more towards him and where we kind of met in the middle and that compromise um, created that, that spark, I think, um, that created a spark between us. And then um, we just start slowly, I mean, we would have, we had local residencies uh, and then still had day jobs. Uh, and after the work day, we'd go into the studio all night and oftentimes go straight to work from the studio. Um, so not only do I not get much sleep in my, <laughs> you know, adult years, but in my teen years, when I was trying to get into the music industry, having a day job, I wasn't getting much sleep either. So I'm kind of used to operating on 
very little sleep as yeah. we all do. But it was, um, you know, I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of stuff that happened. Um, and, and here we are. It's <laughs> cool. It's, it's, a, it's a, yeah. and Matt, I don't, we, we met, I, I, I was the random guy that hugged you at the airport. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember. <laughs> it was right after you made some, I forget what, you made a really funny Facebook post and I had never met you before, but I'm like, man, I, I just got to give you a hug. I think um, it was the, it was that, the post I did about how to be a DJ in yeah. 2018 or something. Yes. Which got yes. me in a lot of trouble, but it was, I had to get it off my chest. So uh, yeah, I remember that was a Teagle, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and so well, how did you get, what was your, sorry if I'm, no, I mean, having I, you all repeat I questions. There was sort of so many different stages in sort of getting into, well, sorry, to where I am now. And, um, but I was really, really, really into the first wave of Electro. I mean, I didn't know who Kraftwerk were, but I, I heard Planet Rock and that was my introduction then to Kraftwerk, you know, back in 82. And uh, back then, you know, that was when break dancing was, was huge in the UK as it was in New York or around the world. And, and then I was obsessed with electro like Nucleus and all these groups. And, uh, and then it went on to hip hop. And yeah, then I guess late eighties, it was, just became house music. But I, I was one. I'm definitely my early days of clubbing. Uh, my friends, some of my friends were obsessed with Jeff Mills, and they would go to Lost. But I found, for me, it was too hard in the early '90s. That style, you know, it was re way too hard for me. And I, I much preferred going to Ministry of Sound and he hearing this kind of much more kind of like this New York well pitched sound, which is then that kind of vibe. But yeah. okay, cool, cool. Oh, um, that's a part of it anyway. Switch up, to switch up gears a bit, uh, we should mention that you've been uh, very helpful to a lot of producers out there on Twitch doing your, doing your classes and all that stuff. How's all that going? And yeah, that's, doing it? That's, that's what I wanted to get to, like, because one of our topics sometimes is what do the DJs do in these times where they don't have work? And you're one of the people who are really getting creative and really helping others uh, in various ways. So please tell us all about it. Yeah. Um, I, the only way that I ever had any kind of semblance of opportunity in this world is by people going really far out of their way to answer all my questions. And like JPLS, I don't know if you remember him, I would annoy him to death at university, him and uh, this other guy, Scoozbot, who's uh, been out of the loop for a little bit. Did they, you guys all go to school together? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. wow, that's the association. Yeah, so, um, I would drive them nuts with asking questions about just every little detail and JPLS would, he showed me how to use an MPC. And I said, if, if you, if that's what you have to do to make techno music, I don't want to make techno music. <laughs> and then like reason came out and he showed me how to do that. And so like the whole, everything that I've ever developed through this has been learned mostly by s someone else's help. And, and so I always, I always had this desire to, to do that. Um, and the, the interesting thing was, is that it, at some point before COVID hit, like I would do these question and answer type things sometimes on like Instagram and whatnot. And it would, it was, I always enjoy interacting with, people that are following me and stuff. But at some point it, it got, um, it got a little discouraging because all of the questions were like how to get a career in music or how to, how much money do you make as a DJ or how much, like, how do you get DJ gigs? Or it was all like the business side of things. And, and no one was ever, asking about 
any of the like artistic side. Right. And um, once the gigs, like once this whole thing hit, there were no gigs to be had. And there were no, like, the only thing that you could do is do this music for the art of it. And to, to just be excited about creating something. And that was really like, that was the kind of foundation of, like, I love teaching. I've been taught a ton by other people and there was there was just no way that I could do these. I, to be honest, I thought that there would be like five people who would write me privately and I would kind of do like messages on Instagram back and forth if they had questions. And then it started kind of just getting more interest than I thought, honestly. And um, lots of people were interested. So I started um, asking friends like yourself and David to contribute, like maybe just like a really basic sample pack. And then you did a video um, to, to start things out. And you're like, oh, and, and, and like, it just kind of snowballed. And people, I, I just have kind of had the philosophy that if, mm. as long as there's interest in this, then why not, you know? And it's actually made me, it's kept me on my toes as a producer and it's taught me, um, Ali, we have a kind of a sh similarity here in that we're learning how to make mistakes in public. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like, this is, but that's really like, you feel very super vulnerable when you're producing like, I'm producing music sometimes, especially on Twitch. I'll start from scratch and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Like, I'm making such shitty music and there's currently 21 people watching me, like, not even be able to assemble a drum loop. But I want, <laughs> you I, I, I want people to see that sometimes, like, people that you like don't, we, we screw up we and, and, <laughs> and like, and you, you have to be able to educate them on the process of like, sometimes you're going to get in the studio and you're going to forget how to produce after I think, 20 years, you know? Yeah. I don't think people realize, I mean, Matt's a machine. Matt can, Matt can bang out a remix or a tune like in minutes, but sometimes, and I have to explain this to some people because they think it's just like, it comes really naturally, uh, you know, at this point in our career or whatever. And I have to explain, sometimes I'll do a remix three times before I get it right. And other times, like in the case of the Grindhouse thing, for whatever reason, there's a certain mojo in the studio and uh, things are happening. And, you know, if, if you're in that, in the right mood where you're able to understand what's happening and you're able to like pull the right things and bring the right elements together, things have a way of just happening and you're kind of helping it along and, and kind of editing it until it takes shape and then it's done. But other times it's a, it's a complete struggle and you're pulling your hair out trying to figure out why. <laughs> and Matt, Matt, when you just when you just did my remix, yeah. which again I can say it's epic, um, you 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 said you had to learn it first. What did you mean by that? Um, it's just the, the process. How, how I'm working is with uh, one APC controller and then two APC minis, and so I'm laying the all the tracks. It's like basically having a, uh, a mixing desk in front of you. And then just, uh, I'm just learning all the parts and then just doing the pressing record and then do, doing it all on the fly. So, and I'm finding it much, and I've, I'm, I've got effects as well, which I can assign. And um, I find this way of working has made, I don't know, it's just much more fluid and natural and more human because, you know, it's, there's nothing worse sometimes than just moving blocks around a screen all day, you know, which I think music became for a while, you know, and so this way it's, it's, yeah, it's like almost like DJing as well. It's, it's, yeah, it's much, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I remember having like 
basically turning on the the dat and then just going live yeah uh, and having four or five different versions where all the effects are live yeah. uh the arrangements live and then you're kind of sitting there for hours piecing different parts of different versions together it was a complete head fuck <laughs> but ultimately you 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 came out with something that that you were into i mean you know if you're working alone it's one thing if you're working with yeah. someone else there's a lot of arguments yeah. about and, which, and which part from which you know version that you ran off was the better so i, I don't get it <laughs> I, I just want to say i can definitely say though that i mean this whole thing that's happening now has been actually great for i think for like carl was saying you know we're, we're i'm at home and I, i'm making music just for you know just for, for pleasure you know i'm not i don't feel rushed and um you know with your actually with your remix i think it's been on the as you asked me, I think a year ago. So I'm finally getting the chance to sort of catch up. And one of the things I found, especially from touring, especially around 2009, 2010, when I was touring so much, I started to forget little tricks and things that I would, was doing in the studio. And um, I definitely think that touring, uh, being a touring DJ definitely affects production. You can definitely see that in most people's careers. You know, the more busy they are on the road, then the music gets worse and worse. So, do you guys work better when you have a deadline or when it's completely open ended? Like as far as delivery date. Yeah, I think both both ways work. You know, there's not yeah. real. I think it's yeah, like it's you said, Ali. It depends. Sometimes you feel inspired, and sometimes I've I've had re I've I've been commissioned remixes where I just can't. I, I've had to in the end. I've had to. Say I can't do it. You yeah. know, it depends yeah. what you're working with. As well, well. I've been there. <laughs> but but yeah. Kyle, how, how do we have to envision the tutorials that you do online? How, how does it work? How do people sign up for this? And what does it cost? That's, that's some interesting for me to know and for everyone there, else there to know. There is no cost. There you go. And the, the, way, I, the way I find it's taken like a few weeks or like, I don't know how long. I've been doing it for, but it's taken some time to figure out the different platforms. I feel very boomer in uh, this regard, like trying to just figure out what, like, wait, so there's this platform where people watch other people watching TV or watch people playing video games. And someone was like, Kyle, people pack stadiums to watch football, you know, <laughs> like, it's no different than mm -hmm. that. And then it was like something kind of clicked in me with that. So I started doing, so the Facebook live stuff, I try to post the schedule every week. And the way that the format that I've gotten is that the Facebook live, I say is more like a classroom type structure where I kind of have a little bit of a, more of a plan of what's going to be accomplished in that class. And then um, take questions and answers, and we go down some rabbit holes, as I as I do. But um, and then Twitch is kind of like if if you it would be like almost like office hours where people can just kind of come and drop by, ask questions, and sometimes the, the Twitch is like if 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 you're if the Facebook live video or series are like a lecture, then Twitch can sometimes be like running into that teacher kind of tipsy at a karaoke bar. Um, and uh, so the Twitch is a way more loose format. It's a lot of me like swearing at my computer because it can't find the samples that I had had in a previous track. And it's a lot more of like, a shit show sometimes where like um, stuff crashes and uh, people send me like ridiculous YouTube videos and so we'll watch it and it, I want that to kind of actually reflect my studio process which a lot of times is watching stupid U YouTube videos and swearing at my computer because I'm not making good music and it's clearly my computer's fault but uh, yeah, so so those are the two main formats, and then I upload the 
Facebook live series to YouTube for like archival purposes. And then I just repeat, I try to post the schedule like at the beginning of each week so that I'm committed to, to some kind of structure and people can uh, know when to know when to do it. So, and there's no sign up, there's no sign up and I'm kind of repeating, like it's kind of a running process. So if, if I have the beginners workshop, then I'll kind of build off of that with those beginners in mind. And then there will be other things going in a different sequence at the same time. So yeah. And I'll, I'll repeat the beginners workshops again, as long as necessary. So do you find that the people that are coming to you, uh, are they coming with more technical questions or are they picking your brain about the creative decisions that we all make when making a track? Uh, it varies. I mean, the, the questions have been super inspiring because it's like um, you can know what two plus two is and that's very different than teaching someone how to know what two plus two is, you know? And, and then sometimes they ask a question that I don't know the answer. So I kind of have to dive in. Cheers. How, what number is that, Chris? Two. <laughs> okay, same. Two. same, same for me. I'm just trying to pace myself. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the questions are about technical stuff and sometimes I don't have the answers for it. Uh, there's some about like, like I've been asking one of the workshops that I did, I said, send me tracks that you're working on, but with a, with a specific question that you have. Because a lot of times you get people and they say, well, what do you think of this track? And it's yeah. like, that's such a broad question that I can't, avow if, if I don't, if I don't like the track personally, nothing happens. Nothing bad happens. It means nothing if I don't like it. But like, if you have a specific question of like, hey, I can't, it feels like the snare drum is just always popping out too much. How do I, how do I make that sit better in the mix? Then you can actually address and tackle that issue. So there's, I would say it's probably 50-50, um, but, Lots of, lots of inspiring questions. And to be honest, some of the, the producers, they sent me tracks and I picked a few of them in this last workshop and I told them to send me the Ableton session so I could actually load up their Ableton session in the workshop and talk about their track in that. Some of these new producers are so far ahead of what I was doing when I was a new producer. I'm kind of jealous, you know, like the, the sound quality uh, and like, it's just amazing. There's uh, this guy, uh, Piotr, if you're out there, say hi, but um, he just started producing and he sent me a track and I'm like, are you sure that this is the first track that you've made? Like, it was really impressive. And so like when I'm getting these sessions from these new producers, I'm looking at their session. And I'm like, how'd they do that? You know <laughs> what? And, and so it's like this, it's a, I'm learning as much as they are probably more through the process. Yeah. Cause like you, you have like, I guess it's like kind of the older producer, you're, you're sort of stuck in your old ways and the way you you're used to working and like that's the only the only way you look at things. And then when you see a new producer doing something that you never really think about or you even haven't even tried, then you're like, what the hell? Um, perfect examples with the remix contest. A lot of these remixes that I picked in the end that were really good were from new producers. And they're like, I've never released anything or I've had like one record out. And I was like, dude, this sounds great. Like, I don't even, what are you, in my head, it's like, how did you learn all this? And they're like, this is the first remix I've ever made. Wow. And you're like, damn, man. So then then I, this just like, yo, I'm like, what the hell am I doing? He's <laughs> killing it. You know, like it took me years to get to sound like that. And these, these young people are just like making these amazing remixes that sound great already. 
And it's like, damn, man, I have a, I still have a lot of learning to do. I'm still learning new techniques as well. Yeah. You know? It's like, it's the never ending process. And then new, new technologies come into play and new ideas and all this crazy stuff. So you're just like, damn, I, it really, it just it never stops. The learning never stops. Yeah. So did you, did they, well, I guess you wouldn't remix the remix. No, no. I didn't, I didn't touch anything. I think Mitch Hedberg, the comedian, he said, I, I remixed the remix and it was back to normal. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but the hard, so, I think the hardest thing is when somebody, like, they send you something and it's technically amazing sounding. Uh, there's nothing really wrong with it, but you quite, you feel like it's, everything's a bit too mechanical and you're trying to, communicate to them because I, I was involved with this bridge 48 mentoring bridge 48 is like the school in barcelona that i'm kind of a part of and and um we started this mentoring program um and and everybody submitted demos through hello demo and we narrowed everything down to like 10 finalists and then damien fisher uh was a great producer new producer uh won uh the, the contest and in under six months of winning um I signed a, a single from him plus one of the runner up, one runners up named HC Kurtz. And, um, and with all the other guys, they're, they're, they're sending me stuff and technically it's all really, really good. And I'm kind of mentoring all of them. Um, in addition to, to Damien, who was the winner and who, who kind of won the, the full year of mentorship. Um, and, and it's hard to, it's really hard to communicate to them. Like, okay, like, but, you need to find like your sound. You need to find your identity. Um, mm -hmm. in, in this, obviously you've nailed the technical part of it. Everything is in the pocket technically, you know, mm -hmm. sonically, but I'm still not hearing you. You're, and that's, that's I, a really I, hard thing to convey and communicate effectively. I, I, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, like, I mean, it all sounds very promising for the future of music if there's so many amazing young producers out there. But I'm wondering what kind of role sample packs play in this. Um, I mean, there's so many, I guess, I didn't really look into it, but there, uh, as far as I can grasp it, there's so many sophisticated sample packs out there that you actually just have to put together some blocks and you have a track. Is, is, can you make a difference Kyle if, or, or whoever is on here, like, A, my question would be, are you s using a lot of sample packs yourself? Uh, and B, um, would you recognize a track which is solely put together with sample packs? Uh, Kyle, w w if somebody sends you a track, would you see it in, in that uh, actual um, um, uh, set that you get sent, the session that you can send, that is like constant, completely exist, uh, consists out of sample pack? Uh, pieces i i think i i'm doing i'm i struggle when i get like a promo i struggle to know if i like it or not like sometimes i'm i'm like i don't i don't know if i like this track i right now i don't but i'm gonna download it because i think i'm gonna like it later um <laughs> and like a, for me a track's either good or it's bad and like I go back and listen to some of my favorite records of all time. And now that I know more about production, I'm like, ah, this was, they were using this synthesizer on this track or whatever preset, even this one, but I didn't care. Like, and I still don't care because that track wasn't about the preset. It was like, and like what Ali says, like if, if you have these well-engineered sample packs, that still doesn't create Creativity. this vibe within a track that that you have. So I'm not so concerned with like I and I I love the good presets. I love good um, presets have been really good teaching tools because I tell people like load up a preset and start subtracting it. Like in Ableton, the operator, you load up a preset and you've got four oscillators. It's like, okay, this is like a cool pad. Start turning off the oscillators and see what it does. Like, 
start pulling back that LFO, see what, see what changes, and then start reintroducing it back in. And you can actually kind of learn synthesis through that process. And um, so for me, I, I don't think that sample packs, they, they definitely get the sonics closer to being really solid early on, but they, they don't make a track for somebody. You know? but, but you've released the sample pack now too with all the tutorials you did, right? Because I, got, I, I, I contributed to some bass drums, I guess. The only thing I can do, bass drums. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? After, after everybody started contributing, I had, I had kind of put together template Ableton sets to kind of get people started. And then when I would teach the workshop, I would upload the Ableton session up to, to the Dropbox folder so people could have a current thing of what I was working on and they could download it. Um, and then you all started killing it with sample pack. So I, I've started making my own uh, sample pack to contribute. I'm like, I can't ask everybody else to do a sample pack and then not do one myself. So bend over. All right. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm but, but Kyle, just one more question uh, because I, uh, I just want to make this clear for all of the viewers. Where do they have to go if they are really keen now to to be part of your next tutorial and when is it? Um, so the Facebook live, the Facebook live stream got pushed back because of this to Saturday at 5 PM central European time. And that's on Facebook live. And then I'm, if you go on Twitch TV slash Kyle Geiger, I have a, uh, schedule that's viewable on there and and really like I said twitch for me I'm just in the studio you know and I'm I the hardest part for me has always been some people they're like man I can't wait to lock myself in the studio for eight hours a day 12 hours a day Dax J would telling me he'd like 18 hours a day and he would go longer but he fucked up his back doing it so like and I'm like that sounds miserable to me it sounds so lonely you know and so twitch like being on twitch where there's like distractions and you're kind of got a chat room going for me it's I, I'm actually making a ton of music on twitch and I do Twitch almost every day other than Sunday. So Sunday that's, is the Lord's day. <laughs> what's that? Sunday is the Lord's day. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday. Yeah, you it's like. Kind of, you kind of have like a, a set daily schedule of when you work in the studio. Now I do. I never that, did it before. Yeah. That's the funny part. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would, there would, I have to be really, I mean, I, I'm super honest with the people that have kind of joined in on the community, like the Twitch community. And I'll say it here, like I had gotten to a point where I was like the DJ, the whole DJ industry thing, it, it, it forced this position into like, if you wanted to serve, like, I'm definitely a C tier DJ, you know, um, if awakenings calls me, it's, they got the wrong number. Um, but, uh, the thing is, is like, I had to think about how to keep things going. I had moved to Germany to do the music thing and to, to DJ and produce and the industry had become so like social media centric yeah. that music to me was like what I got in it for but it had become something that was like from a time commitment with like the probability of that time commitment helping your career it it was it was null and void like when when i first started making music i if you released a record that was that was it like adam bear i remember when you 
first, uh, you charted my first release and I about collapsed, you know, I did a drum code release and I was getting gig requests after that release before the release ever hit the shelves. And then like production became like this, this very, you were losing money on releasing music. You were like, basically, I mean, this was, how do I say it without making myself say I had stopped caring, but I really had like producing music was this passion. And then I started becoming kind of angry at it because of how ineffective it was to move the needle on anything that, that you did. And I was in survival mode. And now that there's no gigs to be had, it's like, ah, like, I love this shit. Like, I love making music. And I didn't know if I did because I was so angry about it not doing anything to, to help my situation that I didn't know if I loved it anymore. And this, so this has kind of brought me back to all of that. Lots of lots of uh, jumping off points to other things that will take up like a whole <laughs> that you said that would take up like multiple future shows. Wow, that was really good. Wow, I, I, um, we're we're already one and a half hours in into our show. This is normally our time where we wanted to wind things down, but we never managed to do this after ninety minutes. Um, so I think it's about time to get Andy on the show, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. So we get Andy on the show. Andy has been watching um, our chats and maybe has some additional hey. comments of our hey, people hey. are still watching us, Andy? Hey, Andy. We're already one and a half hours in, into our show. <laughs> normally our time where Turn we sound off. things down, but we never met Andy, I think you were having something running in the background, so I'm hearing myself in echo. It's terrible. Okay, no, I, I was, because I'm tuned in to you guys on your Facebook, <laughs> and then when I switch over, there's a lag, so I'm, I'm sitting there in the dark for a couple of seconds. It's all good, though. It's the Hi, Andy. <laughs> Hey guys, how you doing? To all those who don't know, Andy is kind of our producer of the show. He's watching in the background that everything is good. He's taking us off the air. No, that's actually Justin from Juice Productions who's taking yeah. off the air if, it, if we're using um, four letter words, right? No, we're allowed to do this. Um, <laughs> for now, so, let's see if it stays up there. For now, and, and, and Andy has been reading your comments and your questions. So what have been people saying out there? I've been trying to read the comments. It's, uh, <laughs> I was trying to catch up with the comments from the last 50, the first 15 minutes of the show, to be honest, there was, there was a lot coming in. There were a in. lot of them? There was a lot. Um, so apologies to, to everyone out there if anyone was asking genuine, sincere questions during that time because I was trying to filter a lot of that stuff out. All good stuff, of course. Um, but we're streaming to so many of your guys' channels now that there's so many comments coming in from different places. And it's amazing how many from, from Twitch, actually. It seems to be more and more each week. And I think this is a platform that um, for music and dance music, techno, whatever is, is becoming more popular. I think you got it. more of you guys are streaming to Twitch and it's quite a stable platform, right? Mm. Um, as opposed to YouTube and Facebook sometimes. So there's a lot of people on, on, on Twitch. Um, there was a shout out, of course, for Tony Allen, which I don't think you guys mentioned at any point because I think that was since the last show. Um, he passed away and then, of, uh, of course, <clears throat> he was lost during the week. So Frederick, Gasson, a master died recently, Tony Allen. That was my last night out before this mess. Uh, Let's have a toast to Tony Allen as well. Yeah, big time. Yeah. He, he played with the master of the TR 909, I mean, Jeff Mills. I think a lot of people saw him on a recent uh, tour mm. with Jeff Mills. Um, a lot of love as well for Bad Boy Bill. That got a lot of comments and a lot of uh, fans awesome. coming in. We, we got to have Bill on the show once. <laughs> awesome, yes. Uh, Mike Henderson, who I think you guys all know, uh, yeah. banging the box four is one of the reasons why I do what I do and how I do. And AJ Calzada said, I once met a guy at a rave in Colorado and he told me, you're in luck, dude. I'm bad boy Bill's cousin. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that gets you if you ever run into AJ, bad boy Bill's cousin. Is. I know AJ. <laughs> uh, you're in luck. 
Um, also, of course, a lot of love for Carl's tutorials and people were asking for the links, but Chris, you, you know, um, everyone go to Carl's Facebook. Can we put the link somewhere? Do we have some sort of possibility of technically that Hopefully, we put I can put a, I can put a link in here and it goes on to, to all the um, feeds at the same time. Carl, if you're able to send me a quick WhatsApp with the link, then I can bang it into all of these. Um, just yeah, yeah. Direct everyone to Kyle's Instagram and from there they can. I'm sure they can find they it can as well. Find. Yeah. Um, but let's get to some actual questions. Um, Rick James, the classic software hardware um, <laughs> discussion. I have a question. <laughs> Would you have pros and cons on someone learning how to produce tracks with hardware synths versus software? Do you think one is better than the other for a beginner or is one, one recommended over the other? Maybe it's a good one for Carl to, um, to start with. Yeah. Well, the f so I started learning on uh, software, basically, like the, I started with Reason and Ableton was the first format that like kind of was, you could compose music like you would DJ. Mm -hmm. And that made a lot of sense for me because of my DJ background. The first synth I ever bought was like probably the worst hardware synth that you could ever buy for your first synth. I love it now, but it was a Waldorf Microwave XT. My favorite synth uh, by far, but there were so many knobs to dive into that and menus to dive into. It was super complicated and I never used it for the first five years that I had it. So what I would say to the person asking about hardware and software, is there is one better than the other? The answer is no. The, but make sure that whatever you're doing, it's, it's inspiring you, not discouraging you. Yeah. And, and that's the real, that's when things are really going to come to life. There's, there's software is so good right now that you can get it pretty much bang on with, with the sound quality of hardware. And, um, if you really want to get hardware, the synth that I always recommend, and it's super cheap now on eBay, is the uh, Nordrack 2. And the reason I love that synth is because there is one, pretty much one knob per function. And so it's really nice if you're learning hardware to just be able to turn a knob and know what it's doing. You're like, okay, the, this went away, what happened? Okay, I turned the attack up. So the attack does this, you know, and, and avoid the menus for your first thing. Understand what synthesis is doing and that'll really help. So, but there's no difference between sound quality. Maybe we can argue about this, but I, I don't. One of the main, I think hardware is such an investment, you know, as well. And I think you, with, with software, with Ableton, I think for any beginner or anyone wanting to sort of uh, get into electronic music or uh, production, I think with that, you can at least find out whether you want to then explore every other avenue, whether it's buying synthesizers or drum machines. But I think something, all the software will give you everything you need to start. So I think that's, that's the main thing. <clears throat> I agree. And I, I, I don't want to make an argument here, but I do think hardware does sound better, but that doesn't necessarily mean it'll make your tracks better. Like, yeah, you can have all the most expensive hardware, run your stuff through there and it's going to sound great. But just like what Kyle was saying, it's like software now sounds so amazing. You can get almost to the T of how close it sounds to hardware and you don't need to spend thousands of dollars on yeah. gear to, to get this certain sound. It's like that comes later. You know what yeah. I mean? Once you get money, once you start making some money, then you want to plop down some money on hardware, then go for it by all means. But you don't need it. You really don't need it at all. So I would say start with software, learn your way around it. You can learn synthesis the same way, just like what Kyle said. Look at all the knobs, turn them, see what it does. I think that's a good way to start. Get knob twiddling, guys. <laughs> And cool. if you really like the tactile feel, there's like really good 200 euro or $200 MIDI controllers. And you can, uh, you mm -hmm. can turn, you can become a knob twiddler for, for that. And you can assign that to anything on software. Exactly. And I think most nuisance now you can, 
they make a plugin for it. So you can run it like a VST where you're controlling some of the hardware as well. So it's, yeah, 50-50. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyone else, um, some hardware? You've talked about hardware in the past before, but any, any like go-to machines? Hardware is better guys? for Instagram, I've found. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's better for showing in the camera too. Should I show my 909 again? <laughs> Strike three. Um, one thing that was a noticeable absence in this week's uh, chat was the, the Corona pandemic chat. So of course there are a lot of questions yeah. coming in, not that it's, um, necessary to talk about it so much but um manuel berg um on the topic of you know supporting the scene and and, and uh, keeping people afloat during this time was asking who's going to help the promoters and club owners or their staff uh, that make the scene at all possible and animated and above all they bear a risk um maybe it's a valid question you know what are the what are the uh, causes that that people should be supporting right now for for those guys promoters and club owners that um who are the ones ultimately that, that bear the risk at the end of the day when they're promoting shows and are there any causes out there that you guys have seen or how do you feel that um that these guys are best supported at the moment anyone have any comments i mean I've, it's a tough I've, one <laughs> I've, I've just done um changing side different thing but i've just done a track for an official now official nhs compilation which will be coming out in the UK so that's one thing I've been doing and I think those kind of compilations or those things helping health workers and stuff like that is super important and um, yeah with the club stuff yeah it's a difficult one it's a different it's everyone I think everyone we're all struggling everyone's struggling everyone's trying to help each other so we're doing what we can can yeah. I I, I'm sure that this has been talked about, but for me, like, I, I hope that people that are watching understand that one of the best ways to help club workers and all of those, those jobs right now is to follow, like, to respect. I know that we're kind of holed up in our apartments more than we would like to be. We're missing that social interaction, but I've watched across the street, literally from my house, people having like a apartment rave every <laughs> weekend for the last like five or six weeks. And it's like that pushes back these workers being able to go back to their jobs. It prolongs the process. Mm -hmm. And these clubs that you really love and the bartenders that you love and the security and all of this, the more that we mess around with this, the more, the longer they're going to be out of work. And um, I think that sometimes it's, it's not these, not always the most triumphant like things that we can do that make the most impact. Um, and it's really different country to country. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what the unemployment situation is, country by country with bar workers and stuff like this. So I would suggest looking into that and finding out what avenues there are to support them through that. Actually, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up a band camp and I'm going to start selling DJ mixes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, DJ, you could do that because DJ mixes are just full of truncate tracks anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, give me all the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, um, I don't really know many. I don't really know of many charities helping club. I, I know I'm doing like a compilation for Lehman and Stuttgart and another one for Parquet in Italy. Um, but I'm, I've actually never really looked into exactly where the money is going, but I know there are some going around for sure. But yeah. as far as that, I'm, I'm not sure what else. No one's ever but, asked. But, but I think Kyle is perfectly right. Really, if, if, you have, if you don't have a charity to give money to or you don't have money and you don't know what charity to give to it anyways, the really best thing you can do to help the situation now is stop gathering 
yeah. and try to prevent spreading that virus right now. You're helping the healthcare system, all those healthcare workers, and, and, and basically just stay home as much as you can if you don't need to be out there, because that is the only thing that we can do at the moment, seriously. Like besides, obviously, if you have too much money at hand, then find a good charity, find like support uh, those workers who, you, who are out of the job, uh, the club uh, workers, the people who own clubs and, and whatever, support them in any ways. But if you can't have that, the best thing you can do is really stay away from other people, period. Yeah. Um, going back just a, a tiny bit we, on the serious topic of, of licensing, Marim, Marim Photo G was her, her handle, was asking how important is licensing as another revenue source? Is that something that you guys experience, actual income from licensing and are there kind of structures in what you guys are doing to get revenue to the artist where your tracks are played or featured? Anyone if have somebody approaches you to if somebody approaches you to license something for like a TV show or a film or something like that, which happens every once in a blue moon, that can be sort of lucrative um, mm. for the label and the artist. Um, used to be more back in the day than than these days, but it's it's a decent you know revenue stream, but it's it's quite rare with the types of music that we're making. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Few and far between. <laughs> and how about pop music and R and B and hip hop and maybe reggaeton now? <laughs> I don't know. And and how about the the music that you guys are playing out um, and the tracks that you're featured, the, the artists that you're featuring in your in your mixes and your sets? Are you familiar with? Uh, how that works when, with with royalties or, or going to yeah can can I give a funds? quick quick rundown like like one thing that I want to add because Justin our technical friend uh, Juice Productions who's who's taking care of our uh, of our stream he just sent a link that is called Save Our Stages in one word dot com okay. um, I, I haven't checked the link but I trust him that this is something that is available to look into. Uh, and uh, there is on Spotify, there's obviously introducing slash artists, uh, not slash, uh, introducing, it is a slash, artists slash fundraising slash pick. I'm not sure what exactly that might be, a, um, but maybe you want to look into this if you rewind and put it in there. Um, but let me give you just, because this is a really interesting topic about the, the licensing, if I, if, I, if I can give this out of my perspective. Um, Back in the 90s, early 2000s, we did compilations and those compilations actually sold really well. So uh, when you happen to be on a good selling compilation, you actually made quite a lot of money um, be because of the royalties, because obviously these labels who released those compilations needed to license your track and you had a per certain percentage of the selling price. Um, and then when the internet got bigger and bigger um, and DJ mixes, especially DJ mixes, were something that was played on the radio. Uh, and I do know this really well because my CLR podcast was essentially a radio show where I was talking quite a bit, but there was also obviously always a DJ mix running in the background. And iTunes was very happy to distribute that DJ mix and it was always downloadable um, for free, obviously. I didn't make any money of this. It was always downloadable for free. So it was a gray scene. So in that moment, when this happened in the internet, it was between 2000 and 2005, um, no one on these mixes, uh, even that was radio shows, which you could say radio show is something that is streamed and you can't download it on your device. But in that moment, uh, iTunes made those podcasts because it was considered a podcast downloadable. So in that moment, uh, you would download a mix on your, on, on, on your device, um, on your MP3 player. You remember what that was? And you were able to get this for free. And obviously, everyone involved in those mixes were not being paid. In 2005, and that was the reason, this is why I was really close to this whole thing. In 2005, iTunes decided not to allow the download of those mixes anymore and took away and took off all those shows which had pre-recorded mixes in them um, because they didn't uh, allow them to download anymore. This is why the CLR download uh, podcast eventually uh, vanished of the, of the iTunes. Uh, and 
we started to just stream it because streaming is still okay. It's kind of this still, it's this radio kind of thing. And, and I think the publishing companies are sort of behind this. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong there. But now the times are changing again. So none of us artists have made, never really made any money between 2000, let's say, 2000 or 2003, 2004, uh, up till now even, with any compilations. I, I don't know, disagree if you want, but um, I, I haven't seen any revenue coming in out of compilations or DJ mixes during that time, unless it was a big compilation, K7, where you track what happened to be on and CDs were still sold. But... I think right now we're entering a phase where technology has come so far that uh, um, especially uh, like with the likes of Shazam, um, algorithms that detect the music in a mix and actually really accurately um, 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 figure out how long a track is in a mix and can um, allocate the, the producer of that mix um, uh, to to the certain amount of time and really fairly can figure out uh, how uh, how to pay this this uh, this producer on this certain mix you know this is why again we're coming back to the beginning it's illegal to sell mixes online now especially on Bandcamp because you're not going to be paying these people but there's new platforms and I just want to mention one it's like uh, Mixcloud Select now where you can basically offer mixes for download again, even if they're for free. Well, they're kind of for free because you pay a monthly sus subscription, but their uh, a algorithms analyze each mix and any track. You, you, you're amazed how, how correct uh, Shazam is out there and how quick mm -hmm. it is. They analyze each mix. They, they print out a track list of that mix, especially of how long each track is being played, of, of course, minus the promos, which are not able to detect because there are no data bank now. Um, but if you are playing tracks that are, have already been released, they are detected um, and they're filtered out and the producers get actually paid from that platform which, which releases the mix. So I think we're entering a new phase where producers, again, might be um, able to make money through DJ mixes in a way. I mean, the same thing with Apple Music and the Boiler Room, um, you know, collaboration. It's a similar sort of thing where, where their algorithm is able to detect what's being played, uh, if it's available and yeah. everyone's getting, apparently everyone's getting squarely compensated, even the DJ. Yeah. I mean, we're still in the beginning of these things, but this is very promising for the future to go back because we've had some crazy Wild West years when it comes to, to, to publishing rights and to rights and everything. Um, and I think we're getting back into a phase where, thanks to technology, the original producer finally gets a bit of a cake again. A bit. It's going to be yeah. a bit. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I think... I think that like there should be always a little bit of tension between with the reality that like as DJs we're basically walking copyright violations and the the reason that we have always been allowed to exist as walking copyright violations is that there was a symbiotic relationship where I mean I was talking about Scoozbot earlier like literally his career he got a couple tours in europe because there was some really shitty quality youtube video of the lights coming on in ibiza and richie houghton playing a remix he had done in the distorted camera phones uh video that's like and like if you produce tracks 15 years ago if a dj just played the track that was enough you know, and and that dynamic has really, really changed over like because those videos were so unique, very few of those were uploaded to YouTube or anything like that. Now videos are a dime a dozen, streams are a dime a dozen. Like just featuring a track in a mix, in my opinion, it needs to go a little bit further than that. And like us as walking copyright violations like 
we should be, have a little bit of humility and always be willing to share track lists, like always be willing to, as whether it's annoying or not, like give the track IDs to people that ask. Um, and Ali, I love what you and Richie did. Um, I don't know if you still do the, the Twitter or- if Radar, it's still, it was Radar where as we were playing, it was broadcasting all the tracks that we were playing. Do they still use that? Uh, is that still up to date or? Brian McDade had been supporting it. He, he, he built that platform. Um, I haven't used it in a long time. It's an amazing idea. And it was really popular. Everybody wanted to, everybody got really excited when they would see, you know, Richie or Dubfire or whatever, starting live now from so-and-so and they could follow what we're playing. But I, I think it, you know, the technology or maybe the way the information was being presented, there was a lot of gray area. Like sometimes if we were playing a track in a deck, but ultimately didn't play it, it would still kind of stream the name of that track. Mm -hmm. Or if we're just loading a track and playing just a loop, <laughs> you know, we're not even <laughs> playing the whole track. We're just playing like a little one, two beat loop or something like that. It would show up, well, which is not a bad thing. Um, but sometimes it was funny because somebody would be like, well, thanks a lot for playing my track, whatever. And, and <laughs> you know, you didn't have the heart <laughs> to tell them. A hey, track is cool, but like, you know, that little loop at the very end, at the very beginning where the drums are kind of building, that's, that's where it's at for me, you know? <laughs> hey, um, I buy truncate tracks for the kick drums. Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, but, uh, Just it, loop it, that it, shit it, underneath the whole set. Yeah. It's a really interesting go. thing that, that um, I would like to see that maybe somehow find its way into, you know, all this new technology that will fairly compensate, um, you know, the producers. And I'm, and I'm all for sharing track IDs. I've never been one to, to keep things to myself. You know, uh, I'm always putting track ID whenever I post a video of something I'm playing on Instagram, because I want people to, to find that artist. Maybe in finding that artist, they discovered the, their entire back catalog and it turns into a love affair with that artist, for some of these fans, which ultimately helps that artist, you know, Definitely. gain new fans, you know, have, have people supporting and buying their music. It's, it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. And I don't understand. There's a lot of kind of techno purists that I see who were very secretive about that sort of thing. And then there are others like, you know, just ancient methods is a, is a great example of someone who's putting up full track lists because everybody wants to know what he's playing, you know, all the, the crazy mm -hmm. EBM stuff. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of people commenting throughout the whole stream about why um, streams, mixes on Facebook, YouTube get shut down or cut off. And I think that's part of it, right? The, the, the minefield that is the, yeah. the licensing and copyright. And it's crazy that Facebook and YouTube don't have a system in place for that, that already. But um, it's, a, it's a whole other topic to, uh, to think about, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I just want to say a big shout out to everyone that commented throughout. And there was a lot of people recounting their stories of their first experiences with dance music with techno with house after you guys were talking about these um, very early records. So there's a lot of people with some nice tales on there. It would take the whole night to, um, to, to read through these, but there's some nice stories. So check out the comments and, and have a read through for yourselves. You're definitely um, going to check out. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have a read one. I guess it's, um, it's getting late. One final one more question for you guys. It could be a nice little round, uh, round the group question, your favorite clubs to play in the world. People want to know where they were. And I don't think we've had that question yet. This already, but no. For me, it's um, Panorama Bar, of course. That's it. <laughs> I have had the pleasure. <laughs> you stole all our answer. <laughs> yeah. I got in there quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, really quick, I'll say, I'll say like Bergheim for sure. But in recent years, uh, Mute Club in Medellin has been like, for me, one of like the top. That's yeah, amazing. amazing. Yeah. And just Super great. dope. A so shout out to Juan. Juan, Juanito. <laughs> Juanito. <laughs> uh, for me, probably, um, I mean, those of us who've played know how magical this place is. Warong in, in Brazil, in the south of Brazil, for me is probably the place where I feel most at home. And they give me the freedom to play a really long set. And 
you have you're on the beach and, and you have the the sun coming in um in the morning uh you know ab above a sea of heads and it's just the most magical feeling for a dj i mean it's one really one of those moments where if you're doubting everything uh in that moment uh all of that goes away and you remember it's a constant remi reminder of why you fell in love with this in the first place so it's always and I've been playing like 16 years or something or more in that club. And every year you expect something to not quite be right, but every year uh, it gets better and better. There's a, there's a club in um, <clears throat> Chengdu, China called Tag. There are, I'm, now I'm Germanizing words. How long have I been living here that I'm saying? It's called Tag, which is... Uh, to another galaxy is the acronym. Um, and it's, it's like a full, it's, it's in the top of this office building, like, and you're going up and there's like a security guard monitoring the offices. And then you go up to the top of this uh, 16th floor or 21st floor in Chengdu. And it's this, it's basically the storage locker of this whole office building and they turned it into a club and it's just super amazing there it's like this uh little oasis in a place that i never would have suspected and every time i play there i play like 10 hour something like this and it and time really flies in that in that place I think we're all going to email our agents after. Yeah. <laughs> I get to look into this. I also have to say, Chris, as a Frankfurter, uh, Tanz House West has, from in the last 10 years, has gone incredible distances. I really think that we need to get you to play in Frankfurt. <laughs> I've heard. I can tell you two things about this because I first honestly believe that uh, once we open up again, it will be local. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've never actually been to Tanz House West, but there's two things. I think that might be, if they want to have me, the first club they're ever going to play again after this lockdown, whenever that's finishing in 2024. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, actually, Kobozil asked me, and I already agreed to him because Kobozil has a night there. And he asked me, Chris, wouldn't you want to come in and play like a super hard 144 BPM stigmata set there from vinyl? And you I was like, I'm yeah? a resident at the night that Kobozil uh, invited you to, and your old studio neighbor is a resident there. I know, Peter. Yes. So come yeah, fight. Of course I know. What are you so, waiting for? Well, until the club opens again. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that no, I, 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 I can spoil the secret now because we're out of, out of work and it's not happening for any time soon. But I already agreed to Kobo Seal to do this. And I told him, it's like, when I come back Sunday at some point from a gig, I'm just taking the early flight. I come in. You do not announce me. I'll come a bit in with a bag of vinyls. And I'm going to play 145 BPM stigmata set. And, and let's see how that goes, you know. <laughs> it's just like that was, our, that was really our plan. Um, but to answer your question to uh, what, what club it is, it's kind of an obvious answer, but it's also, uh, it has multiple layers to it. First of all, I would say there's so many amazing clubs that I play at, and I usually would say like, it's the club that I'm currently at, which is kind of a lame answer, but it's also kind of true because I'm kind of a, a person of the moment. Um, but Berghain has always been for me a place where I can play and you can dive into much deeper levels uh, than in any other place of the world somehow, because you can sink into the whole atmosphere, to the whole thing, the ways it's laid out. Um, I mean, most of you who played Berkheim will agree to me, the monitoring is not essentially the best in the world, you know, it's, it's nearly not. But so you, you tweak it even a little down and you listen to the, to the room sound, which you first have to get used to. And to the contrary, to what most people think, it's like easy to play at Berkheim. You just bang out some crazy techno tracks and everybody's dancing. 
No, it's actually not. People really, they really experienced in there. And if you give them a little bit more than they're expecting, you have them and you can go to so amazing deeper levels there that I've never ever experienced in any other place. So that would be my answer. Berghain is kind of the the default, I think. For yeah. Yeah. that's like the of course answer, and yeah. then there's <laughs> like I just thought it'd be a little boring to go in a group of six and be like Berghain, 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 Berghain. <laughs> you would have taken it away from me because that was my only answer. <laughs> but uh, Andy, do you have anything else in 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 your I'm sure he's got plenty, but you know, like uh, <laughs> so many guys, but um, nothing that. I mean, we're we're over two hours already, and and I think we should wind it down now. And I think next time we should maybe try and keep get Andy in a little bit earlier. So my apologies to all you out there whose whose questions have not been answered, but we promise we're going to look in the comments and we'll we'll acknowledge everything that came in. Um, I want to really, really thank Carl Geiger to be on the show today. Thanks, you were you were you 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 you're, you're uh, adding so much uh, information, depth, and uh, great stuff to Positive. our show. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have one question to you, which, which I'm kind of wondering since the first minute you came on. What map is that behind you? Yeah, I'm, I'm this is a uh, Indiana. A little finding from Kleinanzeigen. Uh, and this would have been a uh, Deutsche, would they call it a Landeskarte, or what do they call the big maps? And um, so it was, it was like a classroom map that yeah. you can tell by the, um, by some of the geography, the kind of time frame, because there's Yugoslavia, so that narrows it down um, on the map, but it's Southern Germany, and up at the very, very top, you have Berlin, um, but it's mostly southern and central Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. All right, so so the lower part is the Alps, essentially, a little yep. bit. Yep, yep, yeah, so. Thank, thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> My pleasure. I was, I was like thinking it was Indiana, maybe, Indiana. Chris, you would be proud of me. I could name, I think I got to 10 of the, uh, Bundestadt in uh, my little Twitch stream I, without Googling. Wow. Kyle, how long have you lived in, in Berlin now? Uh, it'll be eight years in September. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So. Time flies. I still remember, <laughs> I still remember <laughs> watching the World Cup with you next door to your place <laughs> in that little garden bar. Oh, man. With the World Cup streamed on the streamed you know yeah. on the wall in like 2014. Yep. Yep. Kyle That's... has anyone uh watching um you on Twitch or joining in or whatever has anyone ever asked you like if if they move to Berlin will they make it as well in music <laughs> or they will, will they find what they're looking for like how do you navigate around? <laughs> well um the when I moved here I was like uh, like I had already bought one way tickets and I found out through a secondary source that my booking agent was getting ready to get rid of me. Uh, Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> and so that you're, no like, you're kind of, at that point, you're kind of like, I'm committed. Like there's a one way ticket um, to BER airport, which still has not opened uh, since, uh, <laughs> since we moved here. And the ticket was actually going to BER airport in wow. 2012. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I would, and the thing is, is now like with how connected everything is and how you can kind of, I mean, look at what people are doing with their like streaming and all this stuff. Like Berlin is not, it's still home of, like we obviously just said, some of the best clubs. And honestly, there's about five clubs in Berlin that if you just pick them up and put them on a truck and move them to any other city in the world, they would immediately be the best club in that city. Mm 
-hmm. So um, there's Berlin is still an epicenter in that regard, but I don't think it's so important to to be here for to get started. And so I would, especially if you're living in Europe already and you're within the EU, like people don't put it's hard for to make people put a price tag on like friends and community that you already have spent your whole life building in the city that you're in like when i first moved here and i didn't know people except through the industry and i i was really just kind of lost so for about two years i i thought that i had made some big mistakes and I always, that's why I, I, to this day, I think there's some people in the chat that um, this guy Florian, I know is in the chat. And I, every time I see him, I'm like, thanks for, thanks for booking me when no one would touch me with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> that's three meters for you people in uh, <laughs> Europe. That was a great yeah. ending. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Welcome. Cheers. But for any booking agent out there, have a look out for this guy. <laughs> he does his own bookings. <laughs> Do you still have that answering <laughs> thing? If you want to have bookings, call me. Send him a no, page. I, I, huh? I need, I need to reactivate my pager number once this whole <laughs> Get that thing is number. Get that voice. Soon we all have to. Cool. Well, um, we can wind it down, I guess, if nothing else ever, and no one else has anything non-essential important to say. Save it for next time. Yeah. We one, save it for next time. We have so many I'll say, Ali, that took a lot to come out and say that you fucked up. That, like, it's scary saying that you fucked up and not knowing what the response is going to be. And so big respect big respect for that and that takes a lot don't to do it again huh <laughs> don't ever do it again can I, can I just add there was one comment at the beginning when when ali mentioned the elephant in the room from a guy called Calvier. he said ali as long as you're not walking with elephants everything's going to be okay <laughs> oh wow <laughs> on that note <laughs> yeah you know yeah Anyway, uh, yeah, what can I say about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we should not all, we shouldn't check our socials within the next five, six hours. Maybe we should stay away from the internet now. Um, well, thank you all for this, for this wonderful show again. Uh, shout out to Mo, who sadly didn't make it. I hope his son is fine and his teeth are going to be okay. Uh, he's going to be back on the show next week. Kyle, thank you again. I, I, I have the feeling we'll, we'll have you back on the show. It was great to have you, seriously. You just let me know. And, and, and check out his, uh, his tutorials. The next one is going to be Saturday, you say? Saturday. I'm actually going to go on Twitch for a little bit. I, I no, going he's going to go on Twitch. Friend, so in case so. you're still up for it and you're not really drunk yet, not yet. <laughs> follow him on Twitch. Andy, thanks for your, um, always for your presence and your, uh, your input and your, your monitoring us and taking care of us. Justin, in the background, you rock. Thanks for spreading this to the world. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope you tune in again. Are we going to be ne on next week again? Or do we have to first check our socials if we're across the controversy? <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be, we'll back. be back next Thursday, yeah. 9 o'clock. Even yeah. if it's five same people. time, same place. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All good. All right, guys. All right, cheers. Good night. good night, everyone. Say Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Take care. Peace. Bye. 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 Thanks, Andy.